my name is Brian Kane. Uh, I'm a proud member of the Super Rare DAO and a product manager at uh, Super Rare Labs. And we've got Dr. Adam Lowe over here, the Chief Product and Innovation Officer at Arculus, uh, our uh, cold storage wallet partner. And we've got Jake Steinman, Head of Community at Spatial. Uh, Spatial is the metaverse for culture, one of our awesome partners. Woo! -hoo. It's a spatial people in the crowd, awesome. Definitely not planted. <laughs> <laughs> And then we got Scott Gralnick, who's the co-founder of Lago, uh, our display partner, and he's an author of an awesome, awesome book uh, that he can talk about later on. Uh, so <laughs> let's hop into it. Um, this is a question that I get all the time. Um, actually, before we do that, we've got people in the audience. Who here uh, owns crypto? Okay, nice, wow, that's a lot of people, cool. Who owns crypto art? NFTs, crypto art NFTs, okay, that's a good amount of people. Who knows the difference between a public key and a private key? Okay, nice, all right, wow, sweet. Okay, good, so now we know. Yeah, nice, <laughs> all right, excellent. Um, sweet, uh, so uh, the question that I'm gonna pose to all of you is the reason why we're here is what is the first thing that you do after you buy crypto art? So I'll start. Uh, the first thing that I do after I buy crypto art is knowing exactly what address I send it to. So, right, that's the most important thing because the crypto art, it's gonna move from address to address, but the magic is where are the keys stored and how are you handling those keys for that address? So the you know, most important step is when it comes off the DAO, right, and lands in your wallet, you need to make sure that the keys associated with that wallet are secured. So me, for me, of course, they're associated with an Arculus card. So you need to make sure those keys are owned by you. That's step one, right? It's not on some centralized exchange where your assets can get frozen and then you're honestly SOL if that exchange goes belly up as we've seen with a few lately. And secondly, your keys are stored offline, right? So it's not associated in a browser extension or other places where they can be ripped out and compromised. So that's step one for me. Yeah, and I mean, obviously after that, after securing <laughs> your NFTs, I mean, for me, the first thing I want to do is show it off to all my friends. <laughs> and, and not all my friends are live near where I do or here in New York or anything like that, so I bring it into my, my house in the metaverse where I can invite my friends over, put it up on the wall. I can put it up to a size that's like the size of the Empire State Building and uh, invite friends from all over the world to come and hang out and appreciate it with me. Because um, you know, I, can, I can make it any size I want. I can bring it you know, anywhere I want to, basically. Um, and I have a lot more kind of flexibility in terms of who sees it. I can um, not just bring it to my house, I can bring it to the surface of Mars if I wanted to without a spacesuit. Um, so I think there's a lot of different, lot of different ways I can, I can show it off. But also thinking of crypto art, not in the sense of just 2D art that goes you know, on the wall and frames and stuff like that, but also now can think about 3D art and not just uh, uh, photographs and, and, and painted art but whole worlds that can be NFTs. And we've done a lot with that with some incredible 3D artists. So now the world that I inhabit, the world that I put up my NFTs in can also be an NFT in and of itself, which is really cool. Super cool, wow, that's very meta, nice. Now the first thing I do is I call John from Super Rare, uh, and I see if I could flip it for 10X, the price <laughs> I paid. Uh, if that doesn't work, I, put, I frame it in the, the Lago frame over here, have a dinner party and show it off to all my friends. Nice, awesome. So on the topic of security, can you explain a cold wallet versus a hot wallet, like I'm four and a half years old? Sure, I, I frequently get this question with the prerequisite that we explain it like someone's four to five years old. So uh, I think most people begin their crypto journey in a hot wallet and that's totally fine, right? It's the easiest on ramp, it's the big green easy button. What is, what is a hot wallet? So a hot wallet is where your keys are exposed to the net. And I want to make a comment that you know, people often associate whether your keys are hot or cold with whether you own your keys or not. And they're kind of two different things, right? Hot is your keys are in a place where there's always a direct connection to the internet. And ownership or custodianship is separate from that. So you can have anywhere in that two by two matrix. But to, again, explain it like somebody's four, you know, most people begin in a hot wallet that is non-custodial, right? So like Coinbase, where you don't own your own keys. Um, then sometimes people migrate to a hot wallet that's non-custodial, so like uh, Exodus wallet or something. And then from there, people often migrate 
in something like Arculus, which is cold storage. Your keys are offline, no access to the keys, and you certainly own them. Nice, nice. And then why, why do we care about security? What's the, what's the threat? Sure. So the, the security threat uh, for any given hot wallet is access to those keys. So as a reminder, you know, your crypto or your art, it doesn't live in a wallet or it doesn't live in a hardware device. It moves from address to address. It's always on the blockchain. But what is really important is where those keys are located. So the keys are up on an exchange that can get frozen or they're in a phone that the keys can get ripped out of, right? Ask the people that uh, had their Solana accounts hacked the other day. You know, or the keys can be securely stored on a hardware device like Arculus. So that's why it's so important to understand where your keys are, how they're secured, and keep them offline. You're, you're mostly asking these questions for yourself, then. <laughs> I don't know why I avoid it. Yeah, yeah, it was a fun, fun week. Um, <laughs> Scott, does security carry over to uh, displays? Uh, sure. If, if you're connecting directly to a wallet to integrate and aggregate the NFTs onto the frame itself, uh, I think one that's important to show authenticity and provenance uh, that you can actually say, hey, what I'm showing on my frame is the original, uh, and not only can I prove it with authenticity and provenance of it, um, and there's you know certified ownership, but at the same time, just showing a copy of something isn't as exciting. But uh, the security side of it is, it depends on the wallet that you use. So for us, whatever wallet they're using, most likely it's going to be a hot wallet or you know, Arculus did work uh, as a cold storage uh, hardware wallet with Lago, so obviously much more secure. But yes, uh, wallets and security is a very important part for Lago. Uh, although, you know, in our aspect, we're sort of self-custody because whatever wallet that you're using, we don't have any, any, uh, you know, we don't touch it. So that's, uh, it's all in the wallet. Yeah, I, I think that's a really important point around the provenance, right? Like, you know, your keys not only unlock your crypto and unlock your assets, but every time you move crypto or NFTs, you're literally signing a transaction with those keys, right? So if you think about it, your ETH keys, your private keys are really you. It is, a, it is your digital identity that moves and controls your digital assets. So, you know, every time you keep just click, clicking OK in your, your MetaMask button, that, that's not good. Like you need to read the thing that's in the box and understand what you're doing because you are literally signing. Imagine you're signing a check or you're signing a mortgage. You are signing with your key for your digital assets. And that's how you need to think about uh, establishing and managing your digital identity. I feel like they need to make that easier to read like so I actually know what I'm signing, you know? Um, I think MetaMask did that recently. <laughs> yeah, should update. Uh, yeah, Jake, how about security in the metaverse? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's just the same way we're bringing it to the third dimension, basically. I mean, you see a lot of, um, you know, I think a lot of uh, security risks that happen today happen because of things like, you know, phishing attacks and stuff like that, someone pretending to be someone else. Um, I think that's, of course, going to still happen in the metaverse, you know, that's something we're very cognizant of. Because um, you know you can pretend to be someone else on Discord just by you know having your account look like someone else. But imagine a number of years in the future, <laughs> or even you know today, someone can look like someone else in their avatar, and you can say, "Hey, you know me. <laughs> Tell me your private key. I don't know why why you would do that. Uh, give someone that information." But that can still be the case. Ever you know from our perspective, um, you know we have integrations with like MetaMask and, and Phantom and those kinds of things, and those we always link out. Um, outside there, or if you're going to conduct a transaction, you know, we always link out as well. So if you click on a piece of art in a gallery, we'll open up a new browser tab if you're on the web browser, and it'll open up in Super Air, and, and then you'll conduct the transaction there. Um, but I think just, just like you do in, on 2D websites, you know, in 3D sites in the metaverse, I think it's it kind of similar types of approaches to take. Nice. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, okay, Adam, uh, how do I show my crypto art from a hard wallet? How does it work? Sure. So for Arculus, um, you know, it's actually really simple. If you have your Arculus app uh, from the main screen, you tap NFTs and there'll be a, a gallery within your phone that you can see all of your NFTs. Uh, there's a share button so you can send it out via Slack, Discord, text, whatever you want to see. Um, you know, as we discussed, if you want to see it live in one of these beautiful frames or live in the metaverse, Arculus is fully connected to Web3. So you hit the QR code scanner button, scan the QR code on your platform of choice, 
it will push your pub key, it will pull the information, and all your NFTs will be displayed in you know, either of these beautiful platforms. Nice, nice. Scott, we talk about like on-chain verification and all that stuff, is that important for displays? I don't think for every display it's important, but I think for those that uh, appeal to the collectors that have you know, hundreds of thousands, if not you know, multi-million dollars worth of NFTs, um, versus your, a new person coming to the ecosystem, they want to buy a frame just to see and feel what it's like, and they want to show off some NFTs. I don't think authenticity and provenance is as important for them, um, but I think for the true collectors in the ecosystem and that are going to be coming into the ecosystem from the traditional art world, I think is uh, you know, one of the problem solvers that you know, blockchain solves is authenticity and provenance. I mean, one of the biggest problems in the traditional art world is fakes. You know, and with everything on chain, you can you know stop that problem from happening. Uh, and so, you know, we are very, very, very forward on authenticity, provenance, on chain. Even if it's harder for us to do, we want to make sure that the experience is as easy as possible for the end user, and that we show the authenticity for you know everything that is in your wallet. Nice, Jake. What's your take? Metaverse take? My metaverse take. I mean, from from our perspective, also, you know, we. Our platform, we consider ourselves sort of like Web 2.5, um, in the sense that you can connect your wallet and bring your your art, your collection directly from your wallet directly into Spatial, make it super super easy to do that. But if you also just wanted to drop a JPEG or a video file in there and link it to you know wherever you want to link it to your website, Super Air, etc., like you can do that as well. Um, so we want to kind of cater to both audiences. You know, if you're uncomfortable connecting your wallet. You know, because if you heard in the news people getting their stuff hacked and whatever, and like, I don't want to sign this transaction because it's like sketchy, like, cool, just drop in a JPEG and, and hyperlink it out. Like, you can do that as well. So I think trying to um, make it comfortable for all audiences, especially, you know, when I think of Web3, the term Web3, that kind of takes the assumption that everyone who's now Web2 has now been kind of upgraded to Web3. In order to do that, you kind of have to meet people where they are today, right, to get to have that bridge. To, to the next generation. So I think that's why having both those options um, is really important. Because if you're kind of too nervous from a security perspective or, or, or too nervous to set up a wallet or whatever it is, like you can have that onboarding experience, um, but still have that same structure of like, I can put my art up in a gallery or show it off to friends and stuff like that as well. Yeah, yeah sure, go ahead. So in the, just while we're on the topic, how would you, do you do any sort of validation processes where I mean, if I was going to tell you that I was too nervous to connect my wallet that has nine apes in it, right? And I'm going to tell you that I just want to link it to a JPEG. How do you validate or verify that that's actually mine, or do you? We don't do any of that. You can link out to, you know, Super or any marketplace, and people can judge for themselves, you know, just looking at the blockchain, who owns it and whatnot. So I can just play somebody else's you can still play someone else's if you want. If you really like that piece and you're linking out, I mean, it can, the proof is in the pudding that someone else owns it. You just really like that piece. Um, so, right, yeah. I mean, if you're, I mean, if you want to be the person that's like, I own like this super rare ape, like, okay, be that person and then show that off. But people, you know, someone, it's the internet, someone's going to find out <laughs> at some point. They're like, wait, you're not that person. You're going to have a bad day on Reddit. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> or Discord. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't, don't do that. Uh, moving on to like a first time, somebody who's new. We have some people who have crypto art, crypto. People who are new to like cold storage, like what are some of the important security considerations or first time considerations when you're kind of making that decision? Sure. So I think, you know, when people are ready to buy a hardware wallet, we try to make it as easy as possible. You know, I feel like legacy hardware wallets, you really needed a math degree and understanding key derivation to use them. Um, and, you know, it's tiny buttons and tiny screens. So a core design principle to, you know, when we built the product was that I could hand it to my mom. And that was literally part of the build process. I would drive four hours when I was visiting and hand it to my mom. Mom, can you use this? And she can, without any coaching. So you know that is really, I think, important to, to meet people where they are, exactly. So that people just getting into the space, you're buying that first wallet, you know, you're comfortable moving right into a hardware wallet. Right? So the first thing that you need to understand on our platform or any is when you get your 12-word recovery phrase, you know, they're they're in English, but that's uh, a bit of complicated math that takes those words and turns them into private keys. And you know you should treat those 12 words just like the keys to your home or your keys to your car. And I think that's the most important message I can give to anyone is keep them safely stored. Don't give them out to 
anyone and uh, be wary of wallets that back them up to the cloud securely. Well, I, I think everyone should know that uh, Adam's mom is a mathematician. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Scott, as a... Uh, <laughs> Not so much. <laughs> as a new collector, uh, I have this crypto art. Do I just buy a screen? Do I test it out first? What's the, what's the move? You know, to each their own, right? Um, obviously, I want everyone to own a Lago frame. That, that'd be great, but to each their own. I think I love infinite objects. I think it's a great entry point into the ecosystem. You know, if you like your infinite object and your one NFT that's on there, get a mural. You this know, is uh, yeah. infinite objects over here on these screens. We have a mural back there. Yeah, I mean, there's different levels, right? You, you, you walk before you run. Um, I think our screens are, you know, for everyone in my opinion, um, but they are a, a higher price point, so it's not for everyone. That, but, you know, listen, I think everyone in this ecosystem that's building frames, I'm very thankful for because it's hard to do. And so to like tell our misery stories to the other hardware guys, we all can commiserate together. Um, but for someone that even ha has not purchased an NFT yet, they just want to explore, and they have a, a Lago frame, we have a whole curation portal built into it. So you can actually subscribe to other people that own NFTs that you know, maybe Superware has a curation on there that they want to show. Um, or maybe I have my own collection that I want to make public to the ecosystem. Uh, and now you can start subscribing to it, putting it up on your frame, and going back to the provenance and authenticity, people will know that you don't own it. People will know that you're subscribing to it, and they can see through the on-chain certificate on, on the screen itself that who owns it. And, and there's a different uh, viewpoint from what you own and what you're showing versus what someone else owns and what you're showing. But I think every frame in the ecosystem has its own strengths and weaknesses, and you know, every, everyone should enjoy what, you know, is meaningful to them. Question. Do you, if somebody was to put their private collection up and say, I'm glad to share this with the public, do you have a platform that is royalty-based, or they just, you, you have to decide you want to share it for free? Oh, that's a great question. Um, no, so starting off, yes, it'll be free because we want to build a community, uh, but we have a button on our side that says, you know, you can make it Substack model, and you can charge whatever you want. So if you want to say, hey, if you want to view this, we're going to charge $10 a month. Or if you're, you're Christie's, you want to charge you know, 10000 a month, by all means. Or if you're, uh, you know, fuck render, and you want to charge for your own collection, sure. you can do so. Yes. Thank you. Very cool. Uh, Jake, first time metaversing, do I need a VR headset? What's the, what's the deal? <laughs> <laughs> well, you need to break out some uh, computer code. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> uh, MS-DOS and really get into the... <laughs> The nitty gritty. No, you don't. Um, you can use your phone. You can use a you know web browser, Brave, Chrome, whatever, um, and really can go from being metaverse curious to being you know, having your own metaverse gallery in literally as little as a minute. Um, with you know, you can log in, create an account with MetaMask. Just go to spatial.io/login, click MetaMask, sign that transaction, and then you're logged in, and then all your your what you have in your wallet is accessible to you in, in a read-only state. Um, within the interface, and you can choose what you want to put up in the gallery, and then it auto lays it out for you um, in in some beautiful gallery templates. So you can literally go from yeah zero to nothing in a minute. Um, if you want to go to from zero to nothing in three seconds, we launched something called Insta Spatial, uh, which you just can just go to insta.spatial.io/slash like your ENS address or your your public wallet address, um, or connect. Uh, MetaMask or Phantom Wallet, and it'll create it instantly in a web browser, and it's, it's shareable. Um, so taking literally, you know, we've had this whole mantra um, at Spatial, how do we get people in in five seconds? It's five seconds to Spatial, five seconds to the metaverse kind of thing. So that's been sort of our North Star, is getting everyone into these spaces super, super quickly. If you want to, you know, you can use VR, you can use your phone, et cetera. Um, and if you want to have a custom space, like you can do that too. There's definitely levels of kind of technical proficiency, but it's all geared at being as super easy and accessible as possible. Nice, very cool. Um, question for each of you. How would you describe, or what is the metaverse? And explain it like I'm five. It's the 3D internet. OK. It's <laughs> <That's> pretty easy. <laughs> yeah, nice. <laughs> uh, extension of reality in digital form with creativity on top of that. Yeah. Those are hard to follow up. 
uh, I would say that, yeah, it is a creative digital space you can interact with your community in. Nice, nice. So how do we, how do we see this, this crypto art space evolving over the, the short term, mid term, long term, 20 years? Give me your visions. I mean, from, from a metaverse side, right, you know, I think obviously COVID has accelerated this idea of people spending more and more time in, in virtual spaces. Um, and as people spend more and more time in virtual spaces, their virtual identities become much more important to them. What you look like, um, what, how, peop how you're represented, and how you're represented comes down to just like you're represented in the real world, right? It's the, the art you put up on the wall, the clothes you wear, um, the car you drive, all those kinds of things. So as people spend more and more time those things in, in virtual spaces, those things become more and more important. Um, so as you're inviting your friends over, as you're going between metaverses, if you go to Decentraland or Sandbox and things like that, you want you, the things you own to come with you. They're not locked into to, to spatial. They're not locked into any other platform. They're your assets. They're your own. They're decentralized, right? You can take them to other places. So as you're spending more and more time in these places, you can take this content with you. Your, your virtual home, your virtual car, um, your virtual food, which has no calories. It's great. Um, you can take it. You can take it wherever you go. So that I mean, that's what it's that's what it's really all about is is having that ownership. And as we spend more and more time in these virtual spaces, and long term, right, we'll be wearing AR glasses. You'll walk down the street, and and you'll see you know your friend's avatar walking down the street, or you go over to a friend's house, and you can just throw up your art on their wall, and they can you can set up you know this super air gallery could literally be in the middle of Central Park, or it could be wherever you want, and you know that it's you know this is the legitimate digital copy of that art because it's backed by NFTs, but it's, it's sitting here on the top of the Empire State Building or wherever you want it to be. Yeah, so I think, you know, just like I end up, because of our, our legacy, talking about banking a lot and, you know, where we very much see CFI meeting DeFi and at one point it's just finance and it's just digital assets. It's not us and them anymore. I see the metaverse in very much the same way and I have a very similar vision. You know, my, my digital identity has been important to me for a long time, right, because I'm a giant nerd. That's why I'm up here. And, you know, I think that those assets and that digital identity will become more and more and more mainstream and more and more important to the communities at large for those exact reasons. Because people won't have to worry about the systems and understanding the underlying assets. They'll just know that it works. And that's what we're all striving really hard to get into is that I can interact both in the physical realm and the digital realm, and it's just all part of my identity and my daily experience with my friends or the stores I go into or the brands that I like, et cetera. It's just a one contiguous, seamless experience, and I know we're all working towards that. Yeah, I, I agree with Jacob and Adam. Uh, Jacob on the sense that everything will be interoperable. Um, that's just a matter of things being able to communicate. You know, obviously everyone right now is building their own silos, um, thinking about, you know, how things will work together uh, with the hope that everything will communicate uh, in one seamless system. Um, like Adam said, I, I think there will be a, a good progress where your digital identity becomes extremely meaningful. Um, what excites you the most, each of you the most, about the space? Possibilities. Possibilities are endless. Um, you know, taking control of your identity, taking control of your assets, taking control of your own life and providing value in the way that you want to provide value, whether in a metaverse from your home, whether in, you know, out in the world physically, you know, there's never going to be just the digital or just the physical. There's always going to be both. Um, and you can make value any way that you want in which your strengths are meaningful to you. Um, so the possibilities are limitless. And to me, that's the most exciting. Yeah, and I think, you know, from, you know, Web3 space in general, just how quickly it's evolving. I mean, a year and a half ago, you know, when I, I started at Spatial and, and Spatial started five years ago, we were focused on trying to solve, you know, enterprise collaboration and stuff like that. And now, if you would have told me, fast forward five years, we're working with incredible artists um, and creators and stuff like that, I wouldn't have, you know, wouldn't have believed you. Um, but how fast that, you know, that's expanded to, to musicians, to, to architects, to uh, just to generally socially, socially hanging out. Um, so just, and that's only for us really, it's been like the last six months since we've moved, you know, as a company into this new world. So I can't even imagine, you know, where it's going to be in six months from now and how, how quickly, you know, virtual reality and the metaverse is, is becoming mainstream. I've been working in the AR VR world for 10 years, and for years we were trying to sell people, you know, this, 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 what's gonna happen. And, you know, I got, you know, laughed out of the room many times. But now to see it 
I think, taken so seriously, and now that we have the technology that backs up a lot of that, NFTs, you know, crypto, and I think a lot of that, it's gonna accelerate even faster. Um, so, like, yeah, we can't predict what, what's gonna be in 20, I can't predict what's gonna happen tomorrow, and I wouldn't be, <laughs> I'm not lying to you. Um, so, it, it's just, I think that's always, I think there was a, a quote I saw on, on, on TikTok, it was a clip of uh, Robin Williams, and I think he was talking to, to, to Matt Damon, he's like, do you know what you, oh no, it was Ben Stiller in, uh, in uh, Night at the Museum. He's like, oh, do you know what you're gonna do tomorrow? And he's like, I have no idea. I'm like, how exciting. Is that you have no idea what you're going to do tomorrow? I think I think that is really cool that we just don't really know what's going to happen um, tomorrow. Yeah, I think what excites me most about the space, and it's there's so many different aspects to it, really is the empowerment of the individual. You know, empowerment of choice. And you know, when I think about people ask me what's exciting about going from Web 2.0 to Web 3.0 and all the flashiness, you know, instead of everything starting with Google or Apple or a bank. It starts with the individual, right? Your, your digital assets and your digital identity start with you, and then you get to build from there. And you make that choice without asking any middleman whether what you want to do with it, and if I want to send those assets and that value around the world instantly. And so that empowerment of the individual and that empowerment of choice is really what gets me most excited about the space. Nice, awesome. Yeah, thank you all. Uh, very insightful. I'm learning a lot. Um, yes. So I want to turn around a little bit. Crypto art is like one of the most exciting changes to the fire art world in a long, long time. How is uh, super rare and the fine art world sort of adapting to the change of the technology and, and how it's sort of interacting with the collectors and the artists? Quickly is how we're adapting <laughs> <laughs> as fast as we can. Um, yeah, I mean, John and Tom could also probably talk uh, at length about this, um, but. Um, we see a big opportunity uh, in decentralization, um, and so with, uh, like more recently you might have seen, I don't know if we put this on Twitter yet, but some of our space galleries, which are these decentralized galleries that the community votes in um, to becoming galleries on Super Rare, called Spaces, um, they just hit, I think there was a two million mark in one of the spaces, and so we're starting to see that the community wants to have a say in what uh, should what should become art and which artists should become uh, artists and so that's kind of the direction that we're heading in the short term in the long term uh, who knows who knows John what do you think yeah I mean it's gonna be so I, I mean I, I think like a lot of the things we talked about right it's what's interesting is the individual empowerment kind of like cross-platform uh, a lot of the kind of web 2 companies part of the business model was like you're locked in this, you know, like your content lives here, your identity lives here. The paradigm's different now. And for Super Rare, you know, early on, we designed the system to, you know, we were focused on trust and authenticity and it's important that we kind of curated everything uh, heading into decentralizing that curation and then also thinking about like, ultimately the platforms are less important, right? It's about the individual curators, it's the individual artists, it's the individual collectors. And so how can we build tools that support them on their you know, creative journeys and you know, collecting and all those things, so. Good question. Very good question. And now, yeah, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll open it up to questions. Before we hop into questions though, I should say um, that, yeah, like I mentioned before, go and explore the gallery, go and explore the uh, Arculus cars over there, and then up top we've got Spatial, we've got the Lago frames over here, which are looking mighty fine. Um, and then also Arculus is offering uh, a discount, right? 25% off of Arculus Correct. cards. Um, and the, what's the code? It's uh, rare25. I believe the, that's correct. Cider yeah. in the back can help yeah. you out. Yeah, right over there. Uh, I got one in my pocket and it's awesome. Um, so yeah, go, go check them out. Uh, yeah, so we'll open it up for questions if anybody has any. We've got one. Um, how do you guys see volume and adoption outside of the US for NFT specifically? Because um, I spend a lot of time like, you know, going to India, Bollywood is crazy about NFTs, everything, but they're still at the very grassroots level uneducated about like the space, but they're very excited. So Asia and UAE, um, they're super excited, very digitally native, all the blockchain work is happening there, but the volume doesn't exist. So what's your take on it? 
I mean, I can, I, just more, more general metaverse web three, and you guys can talk specifically NFTs, but I, our biggest market is actually Thailand. We didn't expect that. Um, it was we, when we woke up one day and there was, you know, social events happening there and, and, and education, there's classes that are taking place um, in these metaverse spaces. And while it's not strictly, you know, related to, they're not buying and, and selling NFTs specifically, it's becoming an introduction to that. So they're finding these, you know, easy onboards into these virtual spaces and they can hop through a portal and end up in the super gallery or end up in you know, someone else's gallery. And then they're starting to kind of rub shoulders with artists, rub shoulders with these NFTs and kind of learn these things naturally. Um, so we actually, that's, that's our biggest market is, is Asia and, and Thailand specifically. Yeah, I know for us, uh, we're forming special partnerships with certain communities internationally. So we've seen big demand. Um, I, I can't name the partner yet, but in India, uh, is one partner we're working with to bring uh, wallet security for NFT specifically in India. And then we recently announced a partnership in South America. So I can say the, the NFT de their demand is, is global and it's continuing to grow. Because even if you don't understand crypto, know nothing about the assets, people like you know, cool digital collectibles and there's an appetite there. It, yeah, they said it all. It, it's what they, <laughs> what they said is true. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's becoming more and more global and more and more countries are, are getting in. Tom? Hi. Um, my question is more about education. Like, I work in crypto derivatives space, and I find myself educating my clients, which are banks and hedge funds, all the time. So, and like, NFT is still kind of like, I'd say, two years old, because that's when it really came into limelight. So, are you guys doing anything to educate or tell the people step one, step two, and really break it down? And, you know, this term has been thrown around earlier, like you're talking to a five-year-old. I, th I think there's a ton of great resources that exist already. Um, and I think you'll start seeing pushes like this, like Super Rare, and to, not to say Solana again, but, you know, they have a physical space in Hassan Yards. And they have a really good onboarding program. You go there, you uh, first have to download a wallet, and then you sc scan a QR code on um, a tablet. And then it, it sort of educates you on Phantom Wallet and uh, their history. And if you complete certain things, they give you NFTs. Then you can use those NFTs to get USD. Um, and you'll see other, like on Fifth Avenue, there's a place called Web3 Gallery. It's a huge place. I think they probably have like over 300 NFT frames there. And again, it's all about education. Um, I think you'll see in the next 12 to 18 months that everything is going to be a huge education cycle. Um, but yes, uh, uh, something I always point people to is the NFT Bible. I think uh, Alex and Devin from OpenSea wrote that a couple years ago. Um, that's a really good starting point for anyone that's coming into the ecosystem. Um, from there, I'm sure like most major exchanges like Coinbase will have an education cycle or even like PayPal now and Venmo, you could go and see like, hey, what is an NFT or what is cryptocurrency? Um, so, if you're looking for specific programs to utilize, I'm happy to, you know, send you some resources. And, and from our end, um, you know, we've built our community, which primarily happens on Discord and, and Twitter. Um, we've built it as, if you go to our Discord, you'll see it's called the Spatial Web3 community, not the Spatial, we're going to shill Spatial all day community. Um, because it's, it's, we've built it as a community of kind of cooperative learning. We have people coming there who are educators, who are, you know, who are, you know, Web2 artists, you could say, or just traditional artists, um, who are encountering, you know, Web3 and the metaverse and NFTs, and they're coming in and learning from one another. So when you come into, like, say, our community, you can self-identify as, I'm an artist, I'm an educator, I'm a, I'm a 3D architect, um, and they're going in, and it's a community of, you know, an open community where people can ask questions, and they're learning from one another, because we know it's an ever-evolving space, um, and we want the experts are the people that are in our community that are building it every day because this is all being built today. And if we put out, you know, educational material, maybe something about specific, it might be outdated tomorrow. Um, so we've specifically built the community to, to kind of be self-sustaining and self-learning in that way. So that's always a great place to be is to kind of jump into these communities and learn from the people who are, you know, building and creating every day. Do these communities take place in the metaverse? 100%. I can become educated in the, in the metaverse. Yeah, so yeah, that, that happens too. Um, it, I think a lot of times it starts where people are, right, Twitter, et cetera, and then they're like, hey, there's this class happening. There's one class that happens every week. Um, this DJ, he started a class called Mackie's Mindset. It's not necessarily specifically about 
um, you know, NFTs in particular, but he's teaching other kinds of classes, you know, wellness and thought and those kind of things. And there's other classes that happen around Web3 and stuff like that too. So that's actively uh, happening today. Literally, if you go on our Discord, I think there's a bunch of events tonight that are happening around that topic. Yeah, absolutely. We support as much education around the community and the environment. And, you know, a lot of ours, as you can imagine, is how to keep yourself safe, how to keep your assets safe. But, you know, more broadly than that, you know, we've sponsored educational events. We have educational partners. We try to put as much information as we can um, on Reddit and Twitter. And we link to a lot of partners as well. Because to your exact point, right, like, we don't want to be the authoritarian, you know, here is the information, right, because things get outdated quickly. I absolutely agree. But, you know, building that understanding of places to go to try to get that information is fantastic. And then obviously the people here um, are a lot more advanced users. So if you want to continue your self-education in the space, um, a great book is Mastering Ethereum. If you uh, want to dive into that a little more of how this stuff works and you want to take that next education step, I would fully recommend you can buy it. It's also free on GitHub. Nice. Yeah. And from Super Rare's standpoint, it's pretty much exactly what everybody else has said. Um, yeah, we, we find that there's a lot of education around like crypto art versus NFTs and um, and then like all the way down to blockchain and like what is blockchain and why why crypto art. Um, so yeah, other questions? No? Bueller? He has, he has. If you lose your hard key, No, you are not SOL. Uh, the first and most important point is that no one can access your stuff. So if when you when you leave your Oculus card at the bar or something, right, it's protected by PIN, it's synced, not synced to your phone, they don't have your biometric, right, they're not getting access to your funds. Second, you can get a new Oculus card, and during your setup, you'll have gotten 12 words, recovery words in plain English. You can enter those 12 words into your new Oculus card. It'll regenerate your keys automatically, and you're back in business. So no digging through the landfill like that guy in England or wherever he is. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, yeah, so why would you be Solana uh, if you lose your key? <laughs> Wait, why would you be what? SOL. That's just good. Yeah, jokes are really coming out tonight. Yeah. It's really good. It's really good. Excellent. Yeah? Uh, as far as frames go, oh, you're good. Yeah. <laughs> you're good, you're good. Um, as far as frames go, what do you see as next? Oh, thank you. Next iterations um, beyond displaying collectibles. Actually, it's kind of a general question for everybody as well, but primary question is, what are you most excited, excited about beyond digital collectibles, beyond perhaps circumventing financial intermediaries, which you made reference to earlier. What are the, you know, we can't predict a timeline, but next iteration, what is the thing that you would tell someone who was already up to speed and you were to say, here's what I think is the next big thing. And I'm actually particularly curious as far as frames um, beyond display, what's next? That's a great question. Um, so beyond display, it's enabling artists to be able to create outside of the frame itself to engage with the their consumers. So if, like we have under development a gesture control camera. Um, so if an artist wants to create some type of like unlockable experience where, you know, I don't know, let's take, let's take any piece here. Maybe now I could take uh, this piece over here and move it around and look for something. And if I find it, I get access to meeting this artist or access to being be able to purchase that first one. Or maybe I have like a whole wall of logo frames and the artist designed it in a way that as I walk by it, it, the art follows me from frame to frame to frame to frame, or changes differently. Um, and, you know, getting into like um, light and sensors and heat, uh, and enabling artists to tap into that and control all of that. Um, so now, literally, the artist gets to think about creating in a different dimension in the real world that you get to engage in and be, you know, a much more visceral feeling about the things that you own. Could you connect to something like an oracle where it's sort of like, yes. today Yes. And the art changes? Yeah. Sweet. Yeah, but that's all, that's, if, if the artist it, intends for that, they sure. can do that. Right. right. And I think just to expand on that point too, um, in terms of, you know, when you buy, say, this, this piece of art too, when it comes to NFTs, right, you're not necessarily just getting that piece of art, right? There's more to that. So that can give you, it can be a token to get into events 
and stuff like that, right? You can have an exclusive, like you can only get in the door, right, with a, with a rare coin or something like that. It's, it opens up a lot more. Um, so it, it, it's a physical you know, or a visual manifestation of, of a lot more that exists also. I think that's, that's really exciting. Yeah, I was, the interactive NFTs is a really exciting uh, field. I mean, even thing like um, meditation, right? A lot of people like to meditate, some don't, some do. Um, thing like an artist that says, hey, you know, you could do a breathing exercise and the art will change based on your specific heart rate as you're doing meditation in front of this frame and it, and it learns you as, you know, the more you do this uh, and the art get, becomes more adaptive to your heart rate. Um, so it's, it's, it, things are going to become a lot more personal um, and it's just, it's bit, like, it just makes things limitless of creativity and I'm excited to see how that changes. I have a question. Uh, so if the artwork is doing all the work. Why do you need an expensive frame? Wait, but, uh, Adam had an answer. I, I, oh, okay. I cut him off rudely. <laughs> it's okay. So I was sorry. gonna wait till after. Yeah, I, I'll go quick. Um, so I think my exciting thing uh, aligns well to those sorry. is you know connected and secure IoT. If you've, if you've done any Internet of Things security now, it's incredibly clunky. You can barely get like a Nest or thermostat to work, right? You know, in the future. You know, being able to interact with smart devices on yourself that are totally connected and getting information from Oracle or Chainlink or whatever, and interacting with objects you know, out in the ecosystem, you know, that's where everything is working across the blockchain and open standards. That is the future and that's what's exciting to me, whether it be payments or information or art or just interacting contiguously with um, both objects and people. Like, to me, that's what's exciting and I think will be infinitely better in the future instead of trying to you know, Bluetooth your Nest and then connect up to the Google and pray to God it works. <laughs> Tom, can you? Are the back to me now? Yes. Hello? Oh. Um, so I'm just curious, like, if the future is like, all the art is doing all the work, right? Doing all the heavy lifting, is like smart contracts creating different iterations. Why would the display matter at this point, right? Because like, you know, you can just literally get any cheap TV, put it on, the artwork, figure out how to make it inter interact with you, and that's it. Like, and, and you also you can wear a you know VR headset. Like, I'm just trying to understand like what's the difference between a uh, high-end display versus a you know a tr traditional TV. I think ease of use. Like, do you want to buy something out of the box and have it just working? Or do you want to buy something, have to like, you know, hack around, try to figure it out, make it work, and like test things out? Does it have the right computing power? Do TVs have computing power? Um, or do you want something that's like a mixture between uh, a gaming computer versus like a TV? And like something maybe in the middle that has the ability to work with generative art, because a lot of that stuff is very powerful, and you know, <laughs> it, you, you need the right technology to work with the type of art that is gonna be pushing those boundaries. Um, and sure, I, you're going to have a lot of people that are going to like to experiment and do it themselves. No problem with that. Um, but we bridge the gap to bring the metaverse home to make it as easy as possible. Um, so it's like, you know, I don't want to say Web, web 3.0 or Web 2.0 or Web 2.5, um, but we just try to build something that has it all built in to say, hey, you know, it's for the consumers. Um, and you can do what you want and it enables artists to think, okay, there is a system that everyone can have and it's, it, it is... Uh, you know, true for everyone. And now I could build directly for that. Um, and everyone can have a unique experience without trying to, you know, I wonder, will someone, you know, if, I, if, if, if my art is intended to be experienced in a certain way, will that consumer actually buy the separate things and try to hack around to experience it? Or can I just, you know, buy a logo and experience it the way it's intended for? Have you been asked that before? <laughs> I mean, that's a great question. Um, we, we already have our V2 product line already built out. Um, but like, you know, we make sure that our cameras and our uh, sensors are gonna be backwards compatible. Um, and the software is always upgradable. Uh, it's just gonna be a different look and feel for the V2 and things are more built into it versus plugging into it. Uh, yeah, it depends how fast we could develop the second one. <laughs> a couple years, you know. Th this will last, you know, five years. Yeah. You're welcome. One more question? Yeah. Hi. Um, Marlon, um, I work for Leia. We make uh, nanotechnology and AI software for enabling 3D light field displays. Um, 
just curious to know, you know, we are, you know, looking to have people experience 3D art in, in 3D. And my question is, like, how, what do you think the best approach is in terms of getting the general public, 2D creators, to start thinking in 3D? Do you think these new file formats will become just like a JPEG today? Or, or do you think that there's a, a different approach that we need to take in order to uh, onboard people into 3D, particularly in the display space? Um, one, I would look who's already creating in 3D. Um, start, you know, talking to them, showing them what your technology is, and letting them be your warriors. And you know, from there, if other people want to create in 3D, they'll see that there's these individuals already creating it, and they'll start asking, "Wow, this is amazing! I'm glad that my art could be viewed in this type of way." Uh, and then it'll be a downfall from there. Yeah, and kind of a continuation on that point too. When we started. Um, kind of pivoted, you know, into our new direction of, of art and creators and stuff like that. What we started to do was went on Instagram and looked at like the coolest render artists that we could find, and re literally just like get into their DMs and be like, "Hey, there's this other way. Like, you don't have to render your art anymore. You can actually have people step into your worlds," um, which is like a totally like crazy thing. Um, obviously, like the process to do that's a little bit different because when you're building for render art, you're not worried about like poly count and all those kinds of things. So these files end up being like you know terabytes in size. But when you're rendering them on like a phone or your web browser, it's a totally you have to think of of other things. Obviously, the technology will change in the future where you can just stream that kind of like Xbox Game Pass or something like that. You can just stream that to your phone, but that's not like common just yet. Um, so they're, but they're still able to use the tools that they use today, like Blender, 3ds Max, Maya, all those kinds of things, and drop it into a web browser. And then they can view it in this 3D world in a web browser, invite their friends in, they can check it out. And then if you want to like literally feel like have that like holy shit moment, you're like standing in your world, like pop on a VR headset, like go to Best Buy, 299, 399, like get a headset and pop in. And and that's that's what we found to be the onboarding process. Is here, just click this link and go in, and then you want that next level, go get a headset that's already, that tech already exists today. Yeah, I have a friend that's in the space, and I, I guess my advice would be gamify as many things as possible. So, you know, Blender's not that hard, and, you know, they've actually, whether in a physical game, there's a, he, he works in the video game space, they, they've made it where it's almost paint by numbers. So, you know, the same way Roblox teaches kids the code, you know, if you can gamify something and make it easy, and, and just teach them the basics, people will then self-teach the rest of the way once they're really excited about it. So I would just say gamify as much as you can and reward, and you'll get people hooked. Very cool. Awesome. So I guess that, that wraps everything up here. Thanks, everybody, for, for coming out. Give a round of applause to our uh, panel here. Woo! Thank you for having us. Yes, we thank you. It. Super we love you, night. Super Rare! <laughs> All right, yeah, and feel free to uh, adventure and explore. Thanks, y'all. Come upstairs to the metaverse. In a few minutes, we have to set up. Yeah. Nice work, brother. Yeah, dude. Thank you for coming. <laughs>